All right, I think we have enough participants to get going. So hello and welcome to the 20th annual Brattleboro Literary Festival. My name is Sherry Altman. I'm one of the founders of Literary North and I'm so honored to be introducing two amazing debut novelists, Mateo Ascaripur and Lauren Euler. First, a few bits of housekeeping. You will find a link in the chat to our festival bookstore, Antidote Books, and a link where you can choose to make a donation of any amount to the festival. If you have a question for Mateo or Lauren, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions by clicking on the thumbs up icon in the question box. The chat is currently closed to the audience, but we will open it up at the end for you to say hello to the authors. We'd like to extend a special thank you to our sponsors for helping make today's event possible. The format for today, Mateo and Lauren will read from their novels and then we'll be in conversation followed by an audience Q&A. And now I'm honored and delighted to introduce the authors. Mateo Ascaripur is a writer living in Brooklyn, New York. His debut novel, Black Buck, right here, was published in January by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Mateo's writing can be found in Lit Hub, Electric Literature, The Rumpus, and more. Black Buck was a New York Times bestseller and was long listed for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize. Lauren Euler is a writer and critic, splitting her time between New York and Berlin. Her debut novel, Fake Accounts, was published by Catapult in February. Lauren's writing can be found in the London Review of Books, The New Yorker, Harper's, and more. Fake Accounts was an editor's choice pick at the New York Times Book Review and was shortlisted for the Bollinger Everyman Wodehouse Prize for Comic Fiction. Both of these debuts are so accomplished, speak to our current moment, are page turners in their own ways, and are quite funny. If you are interested in the future of fiction, I think you must read Black Buck and Fake Accounts. Mateo and Lauren, we wish you were here with us today in Vermont, but we are so delighted to have you virtually. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll be back for the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you. Happy to be here with Lauren. Um, wish that we were seeing you all in the flesh, but I suppose this is second best. Um, I will read from the beginning of my novel, Black Buck, uh, the author's note. And let me note that the author of this book, while it has my name on the front, is actually written by Darren Bender, the main character, also um, known as Buck after a certain point. So we'll kick it off with the other note. There's nothing like a black man on a mission. No, let me revise that. There's nothing like a black salesman on a mission. He's Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, and any other supernatural, paranormal, or otherwise godlike combination of blood, flesh, and brains. You can't die. Don't believe me? MLK. Yes, Martin Luther King Jr. was a black salesman. In the same way used car salesmen hawk overpriced hunks of metal that break down once an unsuspecting customer drives off the lot, our man ML to the goddamn K was a salesman to the highest degree. Not only did he sell black people on the vision of a unified America, but he also sold the United States Supreme Court, which at the time contained nine white men, the hardest decision makers for any black man to convince. MLK, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Frederick Douglass were all salesmen. Hell, Nina Simone, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, and every other black woman who achieved any leap of success was a saleswoman. Oprah, hide a BMW under your seat. Winfrey is a saleswoman. You get the point. Each and every one of these people was selling something more precious than gold, a vision, a vision for what the world could look like if millions of people were to change their minds, the hardest thing to change. How do I fit into all of this? Why don't I shut up and get to the point? Don't worry, I'm getting there. I'm a black man on a mission. No, I'm a black salesman on a mission. And the point of this book, which I'm writing from my penthouse overlooking Central Park, is to help other black men and women on a mission to sell their visions all the way to the top so high up that I'll have to crane my neck like one of those goofy white people in films deciding whether a superhero is a bird or a plane just to catch a glimpse of them before they're out of sight. Whoosh, bang, poof, the great disappearing act of success. My goal is to teach you how to sell. And if I'm half the salesman every newspaper blog and hustler in New York City says I am, then you are in luck. With my story, I will give you the tools to go out and create the life you want, to overcome every seemingly impossible obstacle, to fix the game. Which game you ask? We'll get there. But before we do, I'm going to ask you to do three things. One, let down your guard and open your mind to what I'm going to tell you. I know we're strangers right now. You're likely asking yourself why you should trust me. The good thing is that you already bought this book. 
So you trusted me enough to part with $26. I won't let you down. Two, understand that I want all people to be successful. But in the same way that Starbucks can't just give out mocha frappuccinos to anyone who doesn't have $14, I can't help everyone. So I'm starting with black people. If you're not black, but have this book in your hands, I want you to think of yourself as an honorary black person. Go on, do it. Don't go don blackface in an afro, but picture yourself as black. If you want, you can even give yourself a fancy black name like Jamal, Amani, or Asia. Three, say every day is deals day and clap your hands. I know it's strange, but do it. And when you do, think of the number one thing you're working toward. It may be a new car, a promotion, someone's affection, or an expensive pair of shoes. Whatever it is, think of it and say, every day is deals day and clap your hands as loud as you can. As you'll find out, every day is deals day. A day without deals is like a camel without humps. It doesn't exist. At this point, your heart's beating and there's a twinkle in your eye. I know because I've given this speech before. I've given it to myself. I've given it to thousands of people wanting to change their lives. And I've given it to people who didn't know they wanted to change but needed it. A long time ago, I was one of these people. I was like you, ambitious, but afraid, intelligent, but impotent, curious, but cowardly. I was all of this and more. But freedom, true freedom, the kind where you do what you want without fear comes at a cost. It's like my urban corner philosopher, Coom Fairy God, Uncle Wally Cat used to say, you can change the hands of a clock, but you can't change time. I can give you the tools to change, but only you can change yourself. And if I'm successful in teaching you how to sell and fix the game, I ask that you buy another copy of my book and give it to the friend who needs it most, who was stuck like I was and in need of a way out, who was blind to the game, but has potential, just like you. Does that sound fair? If so, and if you can do the three things I outlined above, then we have a deal. And if we have a deal, it's time for you to do one last thing. Turn the page. Happy selling. Buck. Thank you. You have a per the perfect reading section for any reading, right? Still all like five minutes. Oh, it's so perfect. And you're just like, you're selling it, but you're not selling it, you know? Um, Thank you. It's great. Uh, mine is, just, I'm just going to read from the beginning of fake accounts. Uh, just a couple of paragraphs. Consensus was the world was ending or would begin to end soon, if not by exponential environmental catastrophe, then by some combination of nuclear war, the American two-party system, patriarchy, white supremacy, gentrification, globalization, data breaches, and social media. People looked sad on the subway, in the bars. Decisions were questioned, opinions rearranged. The same grave epiphany was dragged around everywhere. We were transitioning from an only retrospectively easy past to an inarguably more difficult future. We were, it could no longer be denied, unstoppably bad. Although the death of any hope for humanity was surely decades in the making, the result of many intersecting systems described forbiddingly well, it was only that short period between the election of a new president and his holding up a hand to swear to serve the people's interests that made clear what had happened, that we were too late. I didn't believe all this necessarily, though as the news got worse and more bizarre, I wavered. I've always been drawn to pragmatism, just not exactly a natural at it. As my brain said, calm down, my heart said also weirdly calmly, a paradoxical comfort can be found in drama. It was and still is my official position, if you were to ask me at a party or something, that the popular turn to fatalism could be attributed to self-aggrandizement and an ignorance of history. History being characterized by the population's quickness to declare the apocalypse finally imminent, despite its permanently delayed arrival. We don't want to die, but we also don't want to do anything challenging, such as what living requires. So the volubility with which certain doom was discussed made a tedious kind of sense. The end of the world would let us have our cake and eat it too. We would have no choice but to die, our potential conveniently unrealizable due to our collapse. Until such time, the illusion that everything was totally pointless now was seductive, particularly as a mantra you could take advantage of when it suited you and abandon when life actually started to feel alarming. I myself was soon using it to indulge in some of my naughtier impulses, by which I mean that in the first hours of a morning in early January, when the sky was still dark and the government still inevitably hurtling, I decided to snoop through my boyfriend's phone while he was asleep. 
I never really had the urge to go through another person's things before. After a few disappointing experiences with high school boyfriends, instant message histories, I learned that poking around the byproducts of other people's thoughts usually yielded the mundane, the predictable, and the unattractive. Even with men I respected intellectually, I never found myself in a caring enough to breach their trust. Before Felix, my boyfriends exuded the wholesome, loving, deep down reliability of hot dads on television shows, despite being, as far as I knew, not hot, nor dads, nor on television. Another way of putting this is that before Felix, I had good taste. But over the year and a half we'd been together, Felix had revealed himself to be totally unrevealing, insisting over and over as I baited and nagged and implored him to tell me his innermost hopes, fears, and childhood forward biases, either that there was nothing to tell, or, conflictingly, that he told me everything already and it wasn't his fault if I didn't remember. It was humiliating and typical, and per the usual narrative, I assumed he was hiding something. Probably other women. And I'll stop there. Ooh. You know, um, I had a couple set questions, but hearing that, I'm just going to ask what's first coming to my, my mind. Do you think that social media is ruining the world? I'm sure you've gotten this so many times, but it's just what's in my Actually, head. I don't know if I've gotten this ever because it's like too hard. No, I don't think, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the world ruins itself. Mm. <laughs> Do you think social media is ruining the world? Um, when I, when I ask that question, then when I hear it back, I'm thinking of like, oh, do guns kill people or do people kill people? Right. I think yeah. I, I, I'm going to be honest. I feel like social media and certain technological advances have had, um, detrimental consequences to us as a species. You know, I feel as though just our attention spans, sorry, I'm, that right there too, Harley Davidson, whatever's going on outside, detrimental to our species. Um, but I feel as though attention fans uh, uh, have decreased and are continuing to, to decrease. I'm not sure though. That's just my qualitative approach, right? I would need to do actual research to see if scientists have um, concluded that as well. But what we can see apparent from, you know, what you mentioned in your book, even the election of uh, a certain man in, in 20, if he could be a man in 2016, um, there is the propagation of fake news and more propaganda and all of these things that people are taking as fact. I mean, we're living through it right now with um, people that are against, you know, the vaccine for a variety of different reasons and, and some of that just are baseless. So I don't know. I, I do long for the days when there were no cell phones though at times for sure. Yeah. And I feel, I mean, are, are we the same age? I'm 31. I'm 30. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I always feel like I'm like, oh, I wish I, I wish I knew, I wish I'd been alive earlier so that I could really assess the situation objectively. But all I can sort of do is like reach for this thing that I never experienced, right? Where I'm like, yeah. oh, if only I could remember what it was like to not have the internet at my beck and call whenever I wanted, right? And like, yeah. if only I knew what it was like to like really walk around with a pager. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that, that, that a beeper, yeah. Yeah, well, my mom was a nurse and had a beeper. And so, my mom's a nurse too. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, but my first question was completely um, the opposite, uh, which is to say, I, like, while I was reading your book, I was like, do you actually like, do you like coffee? No. I, <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, so that's coffee. true. Yeah. yeah so no. the beginning of Mateo's book, his, his protagonist uh, works at Starbucks and he's yeah. like, I hate coffee. I hate coffee. Um, <laughs> going on and on. <laughs> now for me, like, um, I didn't have to do a crazy amount of research for this book because I had worked in sales because I had come up in the world of startups, but coffee was definitely something that I had to research because I knew nothing about it. I respect it as a drink, right? Especially because um, indigenous people held it in, in high esteem as a, as a sacred uh, plant. But uh, no, nah, I probably had two, three cups of coffee totally, total in my life. Um, but when I was researching coffee and then Starbucks and saw that they had a hierarchy, sort of like black belts and red belts and yellow belts and so forth and in karate i said this couldn't be better because it is priming the character of darren to then go into this startup which definitely has hierarchies but he is now going to go from being the top of the food chain you know at starbucks as a ship supervisor to now being treated you know as subhuman um so that that was my thought there um for you 
right? Shari just said you're you you are a critic still, or you have done criticism in the past. Okay, maybe it's like when you when you write your first review, you'll always be a critic. <laughs> yeah, you can't um, escape it. They won't let you out. Really? Like, and I was I was <laughs> reading I was reading more about your your history and um, that you may have even might have even written a fake review for your book or or a negative review. No, who said that? That's a great conspiracy theory. It was Wikipedia. That I wrote a fake, that I wrote a that, negative that you, review? That you wrote a negative review for your own book. <gasps> I haven't looked at that. That's very exciting. I wonder yeah. who said that. There are lots of like, but so because my book is about a woman who she discovers that her boyfriend is an internet conspiracy theorist while she's snooping through her phone. She thinks he's cheating on her or whatever, but she's like, oh, actually he has all these fake internet accounts. Um, and she thought that he didn't have any social media and he's sort of a, like vaguely leftist, like resistor of, of like general malcontent. Mm -hmm. um, and she decides she's going to break up with him. But before she can break up with him, something happens. And then she moves to Berlin and becomes basically a compulsive liar. And she's constantly like making up different identities going on um, online dates. Wow. Um, and, <laughs> and so everybody, you know, faking out, uh, and, and I have lots of things in the book that are like sort of winking acknowledgements of like, I use my, she has my social media, my Twitter profile, which is my hair in front of my face. And I, uh. she has that. And, and so, so it's all these sort of like cutesy things, but as a result, um, lots of people have like, you know, think that I'm, I'm doing tricks all the time and think, and there's like some, some sort of famous anonymous accounts that people sometimes sometimes think are me that's my upstairs neighbors um <laughs> yeah we, we we share that we share that um same sentiment because for me i've had people there there are things that happen in this book that of course never even happened in my own life it's not a blow by blow of my own history even though there are parts where my you know autobiographical uh details you know coincide with the narrative but i've had people say oh so sorry that this happened to this person in your life i'm like nah they're yeah. good but but what I wanted to ask you about the reviews um, was what's your relationship with something like Goodreads, you know, and and I'm breaking my own rule by asking two questions at once. But I'd also like to know if your relationship uh, with reviews has changed since publishing fake accounts. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I sort of am fascinated by Goodreads from like a sociological perspective, right? Um, I don't, I like, I sometimes look at it, but I never really looked at it before. Uh, I'm trying to, I might like write about it more generally. And also yeah. about like Amazon reviews are also very interesting from like a market perspective, because mm -hmm. I think they, they are extremely, um, valuable. <laughs> Amazon uh, and Goodreads or more so Amazon? Amazon, particularly I, 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 Amazon. Yeah. Um, and though I, I sort of know a guy who decided he was going to like be one of the top Goodreads reviewers. So it means like whenever he reviews your book, it like goes to the top. I've seen and that. yeah, and he said that an editor told him that a review from him is like much more valuable than a tweet or an Instagram post from like anyone. Um, yeah, may maybe an Instagram post from like Reese Witherspoon, the, the, the queen maker of, of, of books these days. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't think that much about the Goodreads reviews. They're quite interesting, like to see how people approach books when they- readers? Not really. I've read some of them. I have some funny ones. Yeah. <laughs> I, I stopped reading after a certain point. Like I read the first hundred because you read the first hundred yeah before it was like before the book even fully came out so i guess it was from advanced readers and um it was just helpful for me to get a beat it was a small sample size right of what people were were thinking of potential critiques of what people were also really feeling it wasn't going to change my own perception of my book but it was uh challenging me to check my initial intentions to see if they were still adding up in the ways that i thought they were and when i finished the book you know i felt as though 95% of what was in there was intentional. After reading reviews and speaking with people over the last handful of months, it's gone down to 85%, but that still doesn't change my own intentions for the book and my vision for it. But I stopped reading Goodreads reviews when I got my first one star and it said pure dribble. I said, this guy didn't even read it. I'm done. This is not helping me at all. Yeah, I got one. I got, I got one. I like the, I got one, a, a guy was like rant, ranting for like 
this the whole like longer than the screen right you scroll down it's still going and then at the end he was like I'm sorry I misread the genre <laughs> I this is a classic example of literary fiction I guess I just don't like literary fiction <laughs> and I then it but it still got one star um but I think I think it's really interesting like uh whether it is like whether these sort of platforms are like empowering to consumers and like how how much weight the opinions of these people should have right like you're talking about um using it as kind of like a focus group to see if your your book is landing in the way that you want right but i sort of think that there's like a limit to the number or amount i guess if it's like a mass of opinions like the number of opinions you should take in before yeah. it becomes like you have to be able to like discern what is valuable and what is pure dribble. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's, that's, that's why I stopped after that one because it was, it was no longer helpful. Um, speaking about fake accounts or more so the novel itself, um, I had read that you were, you were writing, you know, a lot of articles that you did some ghostwriting before that. What did writing a novel, and I understand that, you know, novels vary in terms of size, but um, what did writing a novel teach you about yourself and, and also about, you know, Lauren, the, the uh, writer? Well, I think what's nice about writing a novel, if you or like, what's nice about writing a book, um, if you're used to writing for magazines in particular, is that you don't have to do a word count, <laughs> which I feel like so oppressed by like, oh, you have to do 1200 words and you, you have an idea and then you're like, the idea quickly like spins out of control and you're like, mm -hmm. I need 3000 words for this, but I have to do 1200. And um, I love being edited and have some great editors, but sometimes when you're writing for magazines, they're like, well, our house style says this. And you're like, actually, I want to put four semicolons in a row in a sentence and you can stop me from doing that if it's a book. So I think that that's nice. And there's like a sort of freedom in writing books that there is less of when you write um, for magazines. But what about you? Because I read that you had written a couple of novels and trashed them before you yeah. sort of hit on this one. Can you yes. talk about that a little bit? Definitely, yes. Yeah. So I, um... I was trying to break into the industry, you know, by any means necessary. And um, I was working in, I was working at a startup. I'd been there for almost four years and my life's mission no longer aligned with their mission. And sometimes a job is just a job, but where I was working very much so like the organization depicted here. I mean, it was the same exact building. I set the, the plot here in the same building I worked in, right. which coincidentally is also where my publisher <laughs> was located. Um, but I, couldn't be there anymore. And I started to, I turned to writing um, as an outlet. And then a few months later into 2016, I turned to writing fiction specifically and said, I love this, this is it. Um, so I tried my hand at a manuscript and that one, it, it didn't work out. I didn't know what I was doing and had a lot of good energy. And I ended up having uh, about nine agents request to read the partial or full version, but no, no offers of representation because the writing wasn't good. So I started studying, writing a little bit more. I was teaching myself uh, with a book called Plot and Structure by James mm -hmm. Scott Bell. Basically an agent had said, Mateo, you might have something here, but you need to work on plot and structure. So mm -hmm. I went to Google. Type it in. <laughs> this book came up and then I got a one-way ticket to Bali and, <laughs> and uh, I went there with this book and I was doing a little bit of travel writing again just like figuring it out and reading this book every day and this 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 great guy James Scott Bell just really helped me learn more about writing learn more of course about plot and structure but there's so much in that book beyond that um, I rewrote the first manuscript and I said, this is it. It's so tight. It's cohesive. I'm going to get an agent. I know how to do it. It didn't happen. No, I got like six who requested to read it. And then no, it wasn't good. So now it's like November, 2017. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I have all these friends that are in the world of startups, still people that are starting companies, getting millions of dollars and saying that I can do it too. And I just had a conversation with myself. And it was that it doesn't matter whether this takes five months or five years, I'm going to continue, continue to pursue this dream, but I'm not going to pander to agents. I'm going to write what I want in the way that I want for the people that I want it to resonate with. So like you're talking about having that freedom, I felt free at that point. Of, I'm just going to do what I want. And um, fortunately, it worked out. There was a lot of revision in place or, or a lot of revision that I had to do. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the gist. Um, talking about essays, you know, for me, I wrote, 
I wrote a review for the New York Times. Like, I don't even know. Time right now doesn't even exist for me because of COVID. Yeah, was like I was like, month. did your book come out before COVID? No, right? it came out before thing. mine. And it was like a month before mine. I don't even know how many books, like, or what books, yeah, for real. But yeah, like a month and a half ago, and, and this would be common knowledge for you, but they didn't let me write asshole. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, what is this? They're changing this, though. You sometimes see them, it's like, there was a story in the Times Magazine that used the word shit. And I think, but the Times notoriously is like, they won't let you use curse words, but I think that they're slowly like coming around, but we just have to keep, whenever we file our drafts, keep putting in curse words until they let us do it. So, so you're saying that this is all, that you've seen this all change since you began writing. Well, writing. I just, I, I wrote a profile for them three years ago and the subject of the profile Set, used a curse word and they made me paraphrase the quote so that she I, she probably said bullshit or something and they made me like paraphrase it so that it didn't have the quote in it and then in this there was this viral story a couple of weeks ago about the kidneys you know about the kidney thing. yeah oh yeah bad art friend I know I happened to notice that the cur there were curse words in this story oh, and wow. so I was like oh they must be changing their tune so you just have mm. to <laughs> anyway anyway you're talking about you wrote a book review no um, no no Disney. that's that's just the point that I wanted to bring up in that um the freedom of a novel and the freedom of working with editors who wouldn't uh censor me and, and it sounds like you had a similar experience was just very refreshing and something that I was grateful for. Um, speaking more about your journey as, as a writer, um, it sounds like, and I'm being careful with this question because I've been asked it a million times, and I could tell that you have too, that you were drawing potentially from aspects of your own life, even if it was just your profile picture, right? That you put in the book. Um, what has it been like to be asked those questions of how much of you is actually in this like what what does that felt like for you because I know what it's felt like for me well I think it I think like it's interesting because I don't really know how to answer them I, yeah. I get the sense yeah, that some yeah. I get the sense probably I mean my book is probably more more part like more my life than your book is yours mm. I, I feel like I read an interview where you said your book was 25.8 percent of oh, your life I was life. scrolling in the beginning I was making yeah. percentages for everyone <laughs> yeah I think like because I was trying to be tricky about it right like yeah. part of the book is sort of about anticipating this kind of question and it's about writing novels and about, about writing fiction and so I think there's a part where the protagonist is walking around and she gets this job babysitting. Well, she gets this job walking babies, um, to twin babies in Berlin. Um, I'm and she's walking just... babies, like <laughs> well, I had this job. I had the, no, like you put them in this job. I had this job. So in Berlin, everyone is a freelancer. And so nobody has to go to work. And so, and also nobody makes, very, people don't make very much money. So they, these, this couple hired me, they had these twins who were like six months old and they hired me to take the twins out of the house for three hours so that they could work in the house. Huh. So I walked them <laughs> and it's like, that's, that's what I did. Uh, and I, she, the protagonist is like listening to a podcast while she's doing this. It was kind of, it was kind of nice. And I got to know Berlin really well. Cause I was like walking around all the time. Yeah. Um, and I just constantly listened to interviews with authors. I was like 22, 23. And I like yeah. wanted to be a writer. So I was just listening to, to book podcasts all the time. Um, and there, there are always, there would always be like an interview with um, usually a woman who would be like, everybody always asks me like how much of my life is in this book and it's so offensive or whatever. And then they don't like acknowledge that of course actually quite a lot of their life is in the book or the book is like actually based on like many aspects of their life. And part yeah. of the thing that's like, I don't know, as I think about it more, I think part of the thing that's appealing about fiction as opposed to writing nonfiction essays is that you can like take what's good or interesting and like reveal exactly how much you want to reveal mm -hmm. and then sort of make turn it into something new without having to like bear your soul right I don't know if you feel similarly but they're like interesting things for my life but my life's not that interesting so I can't you know yeah that's I, I, I never mean. discovered my boyfriend was a secret conspiracy theorist <laughs> yeah that, I, I I it was the same for me in that um I didn't want to give the blow by blow of my own history because I felt as though it's like so what you know um but that that line that is then blurred 
does have so many people asking how much of this is actually real. And, and for me, it was weird because it almost became like erotic. Like how much of this is actually about you? I'm like, yeah. damn, who cares? Why does it actually matter? Alexander Chi, Alexander Chi talks about that. I don't know what's going on. I think the Navy just pulled up. Um, <laughs> that was a weird foghorn, but yeah. So for, for me, I just became so curious about why it mattered. And maybe this is connected to people's love or obsession with reality TV. Um, I'm not exactly sure that that it would be more meaningful to them if these things actually happened. And in the case of my book, I'm like, damn, did you want me to experience this very visceral racism in the workplace? Because <laughs> I did experience and I have in my life uh, experience very visceral and in some cases, bizarre forms of racism that I did pull from but I never had someone pour a bucket of white paint on me. You know, I yeah. even had people that I used to work with texting me saying, oh my God, did someone do that to you before I started there? I was like, nah. <laughs> well, also yeah. your book has so many twists in it, right? Like, yeah. and that's just not, that's that's a convention of novel writing. Like that's not how life works usually. I think in life, you probably get a couple of twists over the yeah. period of over your 80 years, right? You don't get yeah. like 17 in quick succession. Yeah. But I was wondering how you, um, if you planned the book, like did you structure it? Because it, as, because as I now know from the plot and structure, it's very, it is very tight and it's very sort of like well-organized. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. like what your process yeah. was. Yeah. Um. Honestly, I was figuring it out as I went along. So I knew the big twist towards the end or the big reveal. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted my character to be a, a young black man from Brooklyn. Um, when I was 21 and getting to the world of sales and startups, I lived in bed style myself. So I just thought that I'd be able to translate the energy that I had when I was on the, you know, quote, uh, come up into the book. Um, I knew that I wanted him to be at a very militant um, and almost surreal, but very true to form in certain ways, you know, startup. So that's what I knew. And I just began from there and was uh, figuring it out as I went along. Um, it might have only been a couple of days or a week or a week and a half in advance that I would know what I was going to write. And I can't say that I was conscious of it at the time, maybe, but as you know, we wrote these books years ago. So it's hard to like say what we were actually thinking at the time. But um, in hindsight, I realized that that was a blessing that that level of spontaneity from me would then carry on to the reader. Um, but then it was about making sure that the book didn't go too, too off the rails, which I've also found with this novel that absurdity is in the eye of the beholder. There are things in this book that people are like, no way. I'm like, actually way. And the fact that you're not bringing up that there's a pig in the office is strange to me because that's absurd. <laughs> well, what's funny too is both. So my, my in my book, our yeah. books have a lot in common, actually. Um, it's a good pairing. But I think like th both of our books ha are sort of she works at a blog. It's not really a startup, but it's kind of like the media version of a startup. It's sort mm -hmm. of based on my time working at Vice, but also on like other sort Saw of that. Like you have Vice, yeah. or whatever sort of content farms, basically. And they both have people doing push-ups in the office. <laughs> it's real. Yeah. We used to have two guys that would do it every day at 12. Yeah. And and yeah. just like do push-ups. Um, how how was your experience, you know, working at Vice? Um, publishing in other magazines. How did all that, I know that uh, again, per Wikipedia, it said, and now this might not be true because who well, knows we'll never know. that, that you uh, you studied English in at a university. So um, you come from a, a background focused on the written word, you know, how is that, how did that shape the act of creation with fake accounts? Well, I think because I was like doing it in part to get, I always, I think I always wanted to write a novel, right? But the things that are available to you are like, do you want to write a top 10 list about like the best zines that are coming out now, right? So like the first things that I published when I, after I graduated from college were this, these top 10 listicles basically for this British magazine. I got paid 20 pounds per article, but I had, it was like a call, like a listicle column that I did for like a year, which was quite oh, wow. useful yeah. because I was like, having to look up all sorts of like I had to come up with the idea every week for a listicle which it becomes increasingly hard to do when it has to yeah. only be about books and like it, it made me really aware of like both the contemporary publishing market and also sort of like aware of like a broad range of like kinds of literature and stuff so that was quite good um, because I did study English uh, but I was like 
I took so many classes about poetry when I was in mm. college. It was like, it's quite useful, but I'm like, none of this, none of this, nobody has talked to me about Paradise Lost since this. And I read it three <laughs> times in college. You read it um, three times? It's because of class, <laughs> because of class. Um, so yeah, and like, I didn't really even know about like, literary criticism as this practice and like as I do it today right like I knew about like writing papers and it's not that different from writing a paper or writing a book review is not that different from writing paper actually but it would have been nice to like have someone show me they're like a really amazing like like creative weird ways of writing book reviews that people particularly like in the London Review of Books and the New York Review of Books and places like that they're so interesting it would have been like great to know about those but yeah. anyway like I started reading all sorts of things online and I think like from a very practical perspective I wonder if this is true for you too like working in a fast-paced like deadline driven environment <laughs> made it so that I was not super precious about my work mm -hmm. right I think a lot of writers get like trapped in like needing to make it perfect and yeah. I did cultivate an appreciation for having done things right yeah, same, same for me. Um, it was it was working at a startup that was very, very militant. It was the most <laughs> militant startup that I had I had encountered um, uh, during that time that I was uh, there and also since. Um, you have your sales numbers right on a whiteboard that everyone can see. There's no line, you know, hey, man, how's it going? Yeah, everything's great. Great, Sam, you're at the bottom of the board, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you can see. So there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of transparency. You couldn't really fake the funk. And by the end of every month, people were going to know whether you hit your number or not and by how much you did or didn't. Um, so being in that environment definitely helped me to not be precious about my work. There are authors that I've spoken with that say, you threw out a manuscript or you threw out a second one too. I would have never done that. If an agent just didn't get it, then it wasn't for them and this, that, and the other. I came from a world where the maxims were move fast and break things, right? Mm -hmm. Fail fast. So for me, I had enough awareness at the time to know that it's trial and error. I'm mm -hmm. trying, I'm growing, hopefully I'm getting better and I have my sights set on this goal and I'm going to do what I can to achieve it while remaining true to myself, of course. What was different, what was different, like when you started writing fiction, what did you like about it in particular and like what, obviously it's very different from working at a startup, but I would be interested yeah. to hear you like uh, verbalize <laughs> what that is. Sure. Yeah, I just, um, as cliche as it sounds, you know, when it comes to the definition of a passion, it was something that I did and didn't realize how much time was passing. It, I just fell into it. It's just, I hit that flow state and I ceased to exist, you know, all around me. And for me, it was something that I needed, especially at that time in my life when I had given so much to this startup, so much of myself, you know, I was 24 managing 30 people, making more money than I ever had before, but at the cost of myself, so fiction is something that I fell into, something that I felt like um, I had some talent. I wasn't sure. I felt like I had something, uh, even just a voice. I felt like I had a voice at least, let's say that, um, that I could build on. And it was a new challenge for me, a challenge that I needed, especially when I left that startup. And for a long time, I didn't know who I was anymore. So much of my identity was wrapped up in uh, Mateo, the young director of sales development. And I had to turn to my family to help uh, rebuild me. I had to turn to friends that I had uh, cast aside for this place. And um, that's what helped me. But yeah, so, so writing, writing fiction just for me became something that was uh, a form of salvation. And today, I'm not gonna lie, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. Like I'm working on a second novel and it's not like Black Buck where it just poured out of me and like, yeah, yeah I'm doing this thing. Now it's like, damn, parts of this is like real work. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to take it with grace and just, you know, be grateful for where I am. Um, if, if I can go back to criticism because oh, yeah. uh, I don't have the opportunity to speak with someone, you know, who is a critic all that often. Um, I know that some folks, or I've seen some folks studying criticism um, in school or outside of school to try to become better at it. Um, 
I, when I wrote that review for the New York Times, I was like, listen, I'm not a critic. I'm just going to write my opinion in a way that I believe is coherent and um, a, as balanced as possible. But I'm also not going to look to write bad things about these works. Um, I'm also not going to look to just like write great things. I'm just going to write what, what flows naturally and will hopefully be helpful to the, the reader to understand how I think about these books. But for you, what what goes in, what do you call, what do you define as good criticism and what do you try to do to write a good review or a good criticism? Well, I think I just try to, at first I just try to make it a really like good piece of writing, regardless of if you've read the book and also like not too concerned with an idea of what a book review is supposed to do or what a piece of criticism is supposed to do, right? So I think you're talking about people studying it and trying to like imitate it. And I think there is something really sort of like innervating about um, reading something, reading like a piece of criticism that has a clear thesis statement. And then it sort of like supports the point one by one. And it's sort of like, there's no joy and like, there's no joy mm. in reading this. And there's no joy in sort of thinking about the book. And I think probably the most important thing to me is to be like under, I, I have simultaneous like grandiose, like, oh, I need to like I would never say this but let's say honor literature in some way and like honor yeah. like the work that goes into it or whatever and I think that books are important and I think that like reading fiction is important so like I want to like bring that sort of sense of seriousness to it but also on the other end of the spectrum being like I don't want to waste the reader's time here yeah. I don't want to waste waste the time of a person reading my work and I don't want to waste the time of a person who wants to like buy as you mentioned a 26 dollar hard cover right so I think there's this like dual these these both of these things help me at least not get too sort of like lyrically grandiose or like sort of like dramatic about it but also to take it seriously um mm. I don't know if that's useful but also I think yeah. It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice to write criticism because it's not that it's not that important, right? Like it makes quite easy to be like nobody cares about your book reviews, sure. and so it creates another sort of element of freedom, right? Like that you're like, it doesn't really matter, you know. The review also, I think writing a novel, I don't know if you feel this way as well, but it it doesn't really matter if you get a bad review. Do you know what I mean? Like I if you only get that. one review and it's yeah. bad, that's bad. But yep. if you get a, a quantity of reviews and some of them are bad, it, they don't like, as a critic, I don't feel like I'm affecting the sales, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's like a liberty in knowing that as well. Yeah, no. And that, everything uh, is sales, as you know, so. Everything is sales. <laughs> uh, I, I've thought about that as well in terms of bad reviews, like, you know, 10 bad reviews on Goodreads isn't going to make or break me. I mean, some like I received one of those super reviewers, right? Like a couple super reviewers. I made a mistake. Like I told you I, I stopped reading reviews, right? But then I found myself on Goodreads. I still just use it just like to track my books or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I somehow ended up on Black Buck. And then I said, let me see recent reviews. I don't know what I was doing. And I looked and there were two reviews left by like super reviewers that I read that were very thorough, very well articulated and good on them. I mean, for me, when I, when I see a, a critical review, my first thought isn't to be like dismissive or defensive at least. I'm just like, cool, thanks for reading at least. And, and you took all the time to write this. And one of these reviews had like 675 likes. And I was like, huh, I wonder how many people didn't buy the book because of this. But then I'm also like, I don't care though. Yeah. You know, because uh, the book has done well, but also for me, the way that, and, and I would love to ask you this question afterwards, um, the way that I define success for this book, and it's gonna sound hallmarky, but it's legit, is that um, there are people who write to me and say, this book allowed me to see myself in it. It resonated with me. It let me know that I'm not crazy or paranoid or overly sensitive when I perceive something to be amiss and I feel empowered because of it. In the same turn um, from non-Black readers, especially like older white women, <laughs> I've, I've gotten a lot of emails of like, listen, I'm not a young Black guy, but I can resonate, excuse me, I can relate to this book because I have been the only woman on an executive team and this, that, and the other. So uh, for me, that's also empowering and, 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 and gratifying. 
Um, I would ask you, you know, how do you define the success of fake accounts? I don't know. I mean, I think like, does it do on like a sort of artistic level, does it do what I wanted it to do? And mm -hmm. I think that it does, like it accomplishes a certain amounts, like certain things that I wanted. I wanted it to be funny. Yeah. I wanted it to be um, like, I didn't really, I, the thing that I didn't care about, but I was pleasantly surprised when people were like, I was surprised. I had no idea the twist was coming. I couldn't believe it. And I was like, oh, I didn't even, I don't even care if you think that the twist is coming. You know? I'm like, <laughs> I don't care. That's not the point. Um, but like, great. That's great. Uh, so I think, and I wanted it to have sort of like, I wanted it to be well written and like interestingly written and written in a way that I like, which is to say like not morose, like not yeah. overly like self-serious, but like yeah, yeah, very yeah. sort of complicated and like energetic. Um, did you know real quick, did you know that you, that you landed that twist? Like when you finished it, did you know you're like, yo, I know I got him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, well, I came, I came up with the whole thing before yeah, okay. I started writing it. Yeah. And I was like, this is really, this is a funny idea. Right. Um, because the first, I mean, the first, there are two twists. And so the first one, I thought, okay, it would be really funny if, if I was thinking about like apocalypse and like apocalyptic structure. So like where, you know, the bad thing that's happened at the beginning of the book. And then mm -hmm. the book is like, how did the bad thing happen? Yeah. And I thought it would be funny <laughs> to make you think that the bad thing that you know is going to happen is that this woman is going to break up with her boyfriend mm. and then it turns out that that's not that's she thought that as well but then in fact yeah. that's not what's going on at all wow um but no i have to be honest like i don't i read so many books where the plot is like a woman goes to switzerland and is sad so i was not really thinking about plot that much. yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah what about you because you're the confident like the because the narrator is a salesman right yeah. and the the there's so many similarities between like what he does and like what a, a traditional like first person narrator does who's yeah. like telling you a tale and it becomes it's it's really interesting to like see how those two things relate to each other right yeah um seeing you talk about your book is just so nice <laughs> because you were, you were obviously trying to have some fun with it, um, which which I really appreciate. For me, coming into this world, and and sorry, this is just what's on my mind right now. Um, for me, coming into this this industry, sometimes I've encountered uh, just so many writers who I'm like, why do you even write? Because it doesn't seem like you're having fun with this at all. Like, what are you doing? You go do something else yeah. if you want. Um, but hearing how you were having fun with the book, how you wanted it to be funny, is just that's exactly what I was on as well. Um, with Black Buck, yeah, I wanted it to be fun. There are definitely very heavy parts to it, but I thought that humor would be a way to underscore the, the, the various horrors of racism in it. And also for me authentically, um, and it sounds like, you know, we're similar in this way. I'm not a morose person by default, you know, like when tragedy strikes, of course I get down about it. I internalize it. I need to take a couple hours or a couple days or, you know, something like George Floyd, you, you, it's always in you, you know? Um, but then at the same time, my mind starts going to places and maybe this is a coping mechanism of how bizarre is this? Like January 6th or the, the insurrection. Yeah, this is dangerous and sort of scary, but these dudes look like they just watched Braveheart. You know, like waving these flags oh, at the funny. Capitol. Yeah, so so for me with Black Buck, um, I did want it to be funny. Um, with the twist, I, I'm pretty, I like when I finished it, I was like, okay, I got him. Like this, this, <laughs> this, this twist, this big twist at the end would be very hard for someone to ascertain. And I've never spoken to anyone who knew that it was coming. Um, but yeah, for me, it was important to have fun on the page at least with this one do you you said something earlier about um like people not not what i want to ask is if you consider the book satire because earlier you said something about like people thinking it's like not real or whatever and then there are elements of it that are absurd but that have actually happened and then there are absurd elements like the the, the uh, bucks co-workers like pouring white paint on him you're yeah. like obviously that didn't happen but then there are sort of unbelievable things yeah. to the point about january 6th that actually do happen and I'm wondering if you think of the book as realistic or if you think of it as a satire or like mm. to what extent yeah. you know, those things is true. 
That's a that's a great question, and uh, the the honest answer is that there are satirical elements in it. I knew while I was writing it, there are uh, absurd elements. Uh, maybe uh, this wasn't my intention, but maybe to some people it'd be bordering on farce. Um, mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is that I could picture almost all of this happening. You know, you know yeah. when people are talking about white paint or this, that, and the other. I mean, when Sammy Davis Jr. was in the army, there were soldiers that were uh, urinating in his beer and then, you know, making him drink it. So like that for me is as absurd. And um, the more that people think that this story is a fantasy or a figment of my imagination, I believe shows the more divorced they are from the experience that so many of us have in this nation. Um, yeah, hey, Shari. Hi, thank you so much. This has been such we're a, on a roll. Yeah. You were you were definitely on a roll and you answered a lot of questions that I had for you too. But I do have one from the audience and Matteo, you've touched on it. Um, Charlotte wants to know for both of you, what was the path to publication like? Yeah, I went through this and I, I was also curious about Lauren. Yeah. Yeah, so I, let's see. I mean, do you, should I talk about my general writing career and also the novel? Okay, so yeah. my... I graduated. I also uh, have the advantage of having gone to Yale. Uh, so that's always like a tick, uh, really helpful. Um, but I moved to Berlin because I didn't want to get a full-time job. And I had this boyfriend that I met in Berlin um, while I was studying abroad in London. So I, the, at the time, not so much anymore, but at the time Berlin was really cheap and my rent was 240 euros a month. Um, uh, so, and because I, because I went to Yale, it was like mostly free. So I didn't have any student loans. Uh, and I went to Berlin and I paid no money and I worked as a babysitter, as I said, and did a bunch of like copy editing, proofreading jobs. And I started doing that uh, listicle column that, that <laughs> I <laughs> mentioned. And I also was like copy editing all the time. I would edit people in, in Germany and also throughout Europe. A lot of PhD students have to write their dissertations in English and English will probably be like their third language. So they need someone to copy edit them for relatively cheap. So I do things like that. Then um, I started blogging for this website which no longer exists called Book Slut. And I was writing like book blogs basically um, for mostly for free. And then I lived in Berlin for two years and I left, came back and I just started, I got this job. I wrote this like so, somewhat viral review of a, of a book of essays. And from that, I got a job at Vice uh, and I worked at Vice for two years. And when I was working at Vice, I was like, I really want to write a novel. Um, and I started ghostwriting when I was there, which was like enough income to eventually quit Vice and become a freelancer, which gave me some time to write fake accounts uh and because I had all these clips like there were agents around sort of like being like do you have an agent right whatever so I was writing for the New York Times and things like that and I got an agent that way uh and then sold fake accounts uh it was it was quite hard to sell it was quite hard to sell it actually uh and then now that's it does that answer the question it's too long and boring can I ask why why was it hard to sell um I don't know lots of theories about it one of the theories is that people were like it's an experimental novel people were like it's a European novel which is a bit weird uh and then the, like the one the the one that a lot of people say is that at the, when I was trying to sell it it was 2019 and they were saying it was like too critical of uh white feminism at the time and they're like now it's totally cool, really cool to criticize that but before it was not okay to do and I'm like I don't know, you know, I don't know, but yeah, it was like rejected by like, I don't know, like 25 editors or something before. Kevin you were ahead of your time, obviously. <laughs> Two years ahead of my time. That's, that's exactly where you want to be. <laughs> so I have two quick questions for you before we go. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your experience has been like being a debut writer in 2021. <sighs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's been strange, of course, because we're not doing in-person events, but also I don't really have anything to compare it to because this is, you know, I'm a debut author. Um, I have found a lot of positivity, you know, in terms of debuting this year because 
I mean, it's a double-edged sword. You know, there are pros and cons to being able to do three or four <laughs> Zoom events in a day. Uh, you get to connect with a wide range of people that wouldn't be as easily accessible. But then, of course, you are so accessible that publicists and everyone want to just like overload you. Um, so again, it's a, it's a good problem to have to a certain extent, but in some ways, maybe it is more draining. I'm not sure. Hopefully, I'll be able to an experience to experience an in-person tour. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's been different different, but on the whole, hasn't been horrible in my opinion. And people whose books came out this year, like Lauren, everyone's just real cool that I meet uh, for the most part. Um, and that has just buoyed me throughout this whole process. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. And also people are um, buying more books <laughs> during the pandemic. So that's always nice, right? Like everybody thought when, at the, when it started, everyone was like, oh no, books are doomed. And actually it's been great for publishing. So that's, that's quite nice. It's always good to be able to like support yourself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What about your reading lives? What are they like? What about you, Lauren? You said you're reading a lot for reviews. And oh, yeah. I mean, I'm re reading a lot for reviews, right? Uh, I just finished this long article about Big A Zabald, uh, mm. the writer, but I try to read, like, I don't know. I try to, if once I finish an article, I try to read something that I really want to read, uh, yeah. which tends to be something like old. Um, and I have a very spotty, sort of like all over the place track record. So I'm trying to like read things that I want to read, but that are filling a gap mm. um well what about you i was wondering if you had read um this book that i really like called lightning rods by helen dewitt i did read it yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like sales people sales literature yeah i'd read that i remember i i read it while i was uh i think while i was writing or revising black book and uh, I thought it was funny at times. There are also some things about it that I was like, mm, I don't know. There's this one part, I'm not going to get into it, but there's, <laughs> there's this one turn of phrase that she used so many times that just felt off to me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so in terms of my reading life, I have this year read fewer books than I would have liked to just because of events and things. And then there are like blurb requests, you know, and for me, I want to do my, my duty as a literary citizen in the same way that people had provided blurbs for me. Um, so I've been trying to do them when I can, but with doing blurb requests and then having events and then trying to write another novel, it's just sometimes I'm tired. And if I'm tired, you know, I need to focus on, on reading. It's not something that I just do passively. Uh, so it's been a little bit harder, but like Lauren said, for me in between, you know, reading a book for a blurb or something like that, I need to re read something that I actually would read on my own, right. you know, that doesn't just sound interesting to me, but something that is going to help me grow as a writer, uh, whether through learning more about craft or being inspired. Um, in terms of the, the time, like Lauren, I read books that are from decades ago. Um, people like, you know, Chester Himes, John A. Williams, Anne Petrie, um, people like that, Gail Jones, even though she's just uh, reemerged after how many years, 20 or so years, um, while also reading contemporary novels um, of my peers or people who have recently published. So I just know what's, what's going on right now, you know? Yeah. Thank you both so much. Everyone should definitely buy a copy of Black Buck and Fake Accounts. They're excellent, excellent novels. And Lauren and Matea, we just really appreciate you being here. Um, thanks again so much for joining us and hope to see you in Vermont sometime. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. See you, Lauren. Great talking Bye. to you. Bye. Bye.